interested being uh, getting any emails about this or whatever. I try not to send out too much, just kind of announcements of what's coming up next and what's going on. Um, so if you're interested in doing that, make sure you're on the email list and, and uh, you go from there. Uh, we started, we talked about everything from climate change to uh, bananas and the monoculture of bananas in the past years. Uh, we've talked about uh, computer issues. We've talked about just about anything that comes up with science. We spent a, a heavy amount of time talking about evolution and the facts that support uh, evolutionary uh, ideas and why it can be called a theory, but it's really based on facts. So uh, uh, it's been a real nice area, and we really thank the church that comes together and supports us and allows us to have this space and this time to get together. So uh, it's really become an important thing for a lot of people. Uh, Scott Thompson came in a few years back and started doing some very interesting talks about the Death Star Galactica, Galactica building the Death Star. And, uh, and he's talked about the theory of dating, which was a very interesting topic we had a while back. And so uh, he, he's pushed, and I thought it was a great idea. So he does the third Sundays of the month, uh, talks, about, talks about a science issue. And he's got a two-year program he's going through. And uh, I kind of try to keep mine more open for whatever's current or interesting or whatever I happen to be reading about lately. So, um, now that Art and Sally are here, we can get started. <laughs> Art's given some talks for us too. He's a, a water background, water expert. So, um, with no further ado, we'll bring you Scott Thompson. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. So, um, this one's going to be a little more. Uh, a little different than some of the other science talks, and the main reason for that is because, in my estimation, that over the whole two-year uh, journey, as it were, the subtitle of this series is uh, A Wanderer's Journey Through a Wonderful Cosmos. Over the entire two-year journey of programs that have been laid out, uh, I believe this is the most difficult topic. Um, I will try to try to convey it in a way that is accessible and informative. Um, I can't guarantee it will be interesting. Mike said that he gives uh, other interesting talks. This may not be one of those. <laughs> um, but if you find yourself nodding off or whatnot, I, I understand. I will only wake you if you are snoring. Uh, this is uh, this is a very difficult subject, one might even say complex, and that's kind of a, uh, uh, a joke because a lot of complex mathematics has a very specific definition, and we'll talk about a little bit of that during the talk. A lot of complex mathematics went into deriving this theory, and we'll talk about why that is, why is math so necessary to this particular theory. So this is the theory of symmetry theories in nature, or the, the discussion of symmetry theories in nature. If I say something that doesn't seem clear, uh, don't hesitate to, to let me know. I don't have any particular schedule for today, so if we run over a little, um, it won't bother me. Those of you um, who have attended in the past know that we often go over by uh, 15 minutes or so. So I can't guarantee that we'll end right at 11.15. Um, that being said, let's get started. So we're going to talk about what is symmetry, why is it important, and what does it tell us about nature. Um, Dave, do you happen to know where that camera gets started? Yes, it's on. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, these video, uh, the, these are recorded, and videos of them are placed in mm -hmm. our YouTube channel for the humanists of West Suburban Chicago land, of whom I am a board member. And um, the meetup page for the HWSC, many of you have found us through the meetup page for Chicago Science Field Tricks. The HWSC meetup page has a, uh, information on it about a link to the YouTube page that has prior discussions, as well as some of the talks and, and topics that we've covered during our monthly humanist meetings on the second Wednesday of every 
Uh, we've, we've had a, uh, this year we've had a Charles Darwin impersonator to help us celebrate Darwin Day back in February. Uh, we've had people talking about the, uh, the confluence of religion and humanism, uh, all kinds of interesting topics, some of which are up on that page. So I recommend that you check that out. Also, um, I would like to thank this particular organization, this church, for providing the space, the facilities, and the support um, to, uh, to have these talks. So I don't believe in anything supernatural. That's a key tenet of, of uh, humanism. And yet I have found this church to be um, a very welcome place uh, to, uh, to express my ideas, to find community members and other people who have similar dispositions. So that's the commercial part. Uh, symmetry, what is symmetry? We perceive symmetry in a lot of natural shapes. And in fact, there's whole theories about the way that uh, the human brain processes the very notion of beauty. And one of the key aspects that seems to be entailed in our perception and uh, diagnosis of beauty is symmetry. So you see that this depiction of butterflies, right? the fact that the two sides of the butterfly mirror one another almost, if not all, uh, exactly perfectly, gives rise to a certain symmetry. And these kinds of symmetries are abundant in nature. You'll notice that people and most animals are, uh, are bilaterally symmetric. Although occasionally you will find something that uh, is in a body or a part of a body that isn't bilaterally symmetric, like the heart. Right? The heart is a little over to one side, or the liver is a little over to one side. So sometimes symmetry isn't perfect, but you can still recognize some underlying symmetry in many of the things of nature. This kind of recognition of the deep impact of symmetry is prevalent in particle physics as well. In prior lectures in this series, we have covered topics from relativity and particle physics. And some of those same topics will be germane to today's discussion as well. Here's another symmetrical image. You might look at this and you might perceive beauty. And yet, any given portion of this image may be perceived to be relatively chaotic and random. So simply by virtue of adding symmetry to what might otherwise be a chaotic system, we can begin to impose a certain pattern. And that recognition of pattern, again, is implicated in our perception of the concept of beauty. Speaking of the concepts of beauty, this is one of the most beautiful minds that has ever existed in terms of mathematics. This is a lady named Emmy Noether. And Emmy Noether was an, a very active mathematician. Uh, she was a German Jewish mathematician about the time when that was uh, perilous. So she emigrated to the United States and eventually taught at, uh, I believe, Ron Maher College, which was an all girls college. But Emmy Noether was a fantastic uh, mathematician with an incredible mind. And one of the things that she discovered was that any time a physical law exhibits a symmetry, there is associated with that something that is conserved. The most basic examples of that are twofold. One is, if I do something here, I happen to have a handy little object. If I do something here, I throw this object up in the air and it comes back down. And if I do it over here, or if I were to go outside or go to Colorado or any number of other places in the universe and do that same experiment, I would see that the results would be highly symmetrical. I would not expect that the behavior of that particular experiment to change as long as the gravity field that I'm in also remains relatively constant. There are many experiments that can and do happen in science that are in no way predicated upon gravity. And those experiments certainly exhibit a symmetry. They happen the same on Pluto. They happen the same in the Andromeda galaxy. They happen the same in your backyard. <laughs> that kind of symmetry is something that is easy to take for granted. 
it's easy for us to say, well, of course that's the way it is. That's the way it has to be to have a regular, orderly universe. But Emmy Noether recognized that there was something very profound in this exceptionally simple notion. And that profound thing is that essentially a body in motion will remain in motion unless acted upon by an outside force, or a body at rest will remain at rest unless acted upon by an outside force. So Emmy recognized that momentum and the conservation of momentum is directly a result of the fact that space is symmetrical, that one place is much like another, accepting the presence of particular fields that impact parts of nature, like gravity fields. The second example of the implication of her discovery is that if I do that experiment, I did it two minutes ago, three minutes ago, if I do it again now, I can expect the same results. The key notion there is that doing the same kind of physical processes at different times gives rise to another conserved quantity that we recognize in nature. And that conserved quantity is energy. One of the things that you sometimes hear um, in, in, from sources that are less than credible from a scientific standpoint is maybe the universe was vastly different yesterday than is today. Or if not yesterday, then perhaps 6,000 years ago there was some magical event that occurred that made 6,000 years ago very much different than the world we see around us today, accepting all of the natural processes like volcanoes and whatnot that do occur and do cause changes through time. The laws of nature themselves should be constant through time. And we have proof of that when we look at the light from stars that are shining quintillions of miles away. Well, the light from those stars must have taken, in some cases, billions of years to reach our instruments or our eyes. And we can dissect that light, as it were, to recognize that the physical processes entailed in manufacturing that billion-year-old light is this identical set of physical properties and processes that generate light today. Well, that notion that the laws of science remain constant through time, because of Emmy Noether's ideas, have a very direct consequence. And that consequence is that energy is conserved. Now, we may have refined that a bit in the years since Einstein to say that mass energy is conserved. Mass and energy can sometimes change from one to another. So, in essence, that conservation of mass energy is a direct result of the symmetry of physical processes through time. So there's two key profound symmetries that are expressed by her ideas. Um, like I said, you can have forces like gravity or like electromagnetic forces that might perturb or disturb a system and change the outcomes. But again, those self-same forces are also uh, predictable and their effects remain relatively constant through time. And then there's this notion of something called a broken symmetry. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next few minutes. The idea is that you can take something that is fundamentally symmetrical, some physical process or attribute of the universe, and just like the heart, is displaced a little in your body, you can have almost perfect symmetry, but it may be broken by one outlier or by one set of phenomena that aren't exactly symmetrical. Well, science likes to understand why that happens, but it is evident from various experiments that it does happen. So we'll talk about broken symmetry. Speaking of broken symmetry, this is a sculpture this sculpture, those of you who have attended a lecture at Fermilab will recognize that you drive underneath this sculpture on your way to the uh, Wilson Hall. This sculpture was, was designed by one of the directors of Fermilab, and it is in fact called Broken Symmetry. This sculpture represents the notion that symmetry is an inherent and deeply profound aspect of nature and that broken symmetries or imperfect symmetries 
are implicated in many of the phenomena that allow us to exist. The fact that we're made of atoms and molecules, the fact that the sun turns hydrogen into helium, many other processes that enable the complexities in the universe that we see around us derive directly as a result of these slightly broken symmetries. So you see that this sculpture, the pieces of it are slightly offset. It's not perfectly symmetric. This is broken symmetry in art. Here's another view. So one of the things you'll notice by taking this view of the sculpture is that your perspective can cause what would otherwise be a broken symmetry to look more, uh, more like a perfect symmetry. The three arms of the statue uh, or the sculpture seem to come together more, uh, more perfectly in this particular perspective of that symmetry. So this is another lesson for us that applies to basic physics, is that sometimes by changing the perspective that we're using to visualize or probe or analyze a given phenomena, we can uncover what would otherwise have been a broken or a hidden symmetry. So I'd like to do some symmetry demonstrations now. Um, I have several objects here. Let's start with this object. Okay? This is uh, some kind of uh, pyramidal shape. And you'll notice that if I rotate it a little bit, it begins to look a little different. Wherever you are in the room, no matter your particular perspective, as I rotate this, what you see changes. If I rotate it this way, you'll notice that there are certain discrete rotations that I can impose upon this object. I can rotate it by 90 degrees, and it looks unchanged. If I rotate it by less than 90 degrees, then it changes. There's another symmetry. I can do this. There is only one rotation of this object that returns it to an identical position when rotating about <coughs> this axis, and that rotation is that. So there are very clear and discrete symmetries exhibited by this object. Here's another object. This object has even more symmetries. Unlike the previous object, I can rotate it 90 degrees this way, and it seems the same. I can rotate it 90 degrees this way, and it seems the same. I cannot rotate it 90 degrees this way and have it be the same. I'm sorry, what? Why not? Um, it, it's just the visual aspect, the, 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 the space that this takes up and the impact that uh, your, your perception of the space that this takes up on your retina, the way you perceive it changes. One of the definitions of symmetry mathematically is it's the set of all manipulations you can impose upon an object such that it is unrecognizable that you've done something. But you should be able to rotate the 90 degree over any of those three axes. Exactly correct. So the set of symmetries of this is larger than the set of symmetries of this. Even though I could rotate or twist it by 90 degrees, I could not twist it this way by 90 degrees. It has fewer symmetries than this, which I can twist by 90 degrees. Does that make sense? Okay. So symmetries can sometimes be discrete. Symmetries can also be continuous. So if I take this object, I can rotate it by any angle, and it doesn't change, as long as I'm rotating it around this axis. If I rotate it around this axis, now I can rotate it by 180 degrees, and it looks unchanged. So different systems, different configurations, have different symmetries, depending upon their particular characteristics. One of the most symmetrical known configurations is this. I can do any arbitrary rotation on this particular system, and as long as I keep it 
centered at the same point in space, it will look identical. You don't expect its characteristics to change. Now, let's say that these are particles in a particle accelerator, and I'm bouncing things off of them in order to determine their characteristics. You can imagine that if I bounce something off of an edge here, it will behave differently than if I bounce something off of the face. So the underlying or microscopic symmetries of different systems can be discovered by probing those systems. And in a prior talk, I've described the difference between throwing basketballs at a human being and having them bounce off in order to get some sense of the shape or location of that human being. Or tennis balls, which one would give us a more granular picture of the human being? The tennis balls, right? So the, the selection of the mechanism that we use to interact with the system can also help bring into focus different symmetries. <clears throat> So let's talk about hidden symmetries. Um, the same symmetry that exists in a snowflake exists in this situation. I'm sorry, <laughs> going back. Exists in this situation, right? Ice has a, um, a symmetric quality to it. Water molecules, when frozen, have a symmetric quality to it. And not only do they have a different symmetric quality when they're frozen, but their gross properties with which you may interact at some macroscopic scale change based upon whether that symmetry is in play or not. Interacting with water in this form requires some pitons and ropes, or maybe blades on an ice skate. Interacting with water in this form entails a whole set of different interactions. And interacting with water in that form <laughs> is another set of interactions. So, for example, you wouldn't be able to swim in an ice cube. You can't climb a pond. You can't skate in a sauna or ice skate in Asana specifically. One other thing about this symmetry that water can exhibit is that that symmetry only becomes evident at a particular temperature. So symmetry can be temperature related. So I want to talk about the hottest place on Earth. Anybody have a guess who isn't already a scientist? Uh, anybody have a guess about the hottest place on Earth? Center. The center of the Earth? Great, great, uh, great example. Um, I'm pretty sure this place is hotter. In fact, I'm certain this place is hotter. Uh, a nuclear explosion. A nuclear explosion. Another great, great example. This place is hotter. Hadron Collider? The Large Hadron Collider. The reason that we build particle accelerators is to make matter as hot as we possibly can. And by virtue of doing that, we make conditions that have not existed in nature except during the first few microseconds after the Big Bang. Now, why is heat important? Well, I talked about the change from ice to water to steam. Those are called phase changes. The symmetry of a water molecule, the way that it forms crystals, does not exhibit itself until you get uh, get water at a particular temperature. So, one of the key aspects to exploring nature and some of the symmetries that may exhibit themselves in terms of the fundamental constituents of nature, smaller than atoms, smaller than mo molecules of water, necessitate high temperature. And these machines, and this is a picture of um, a nice landscape with mountains in the back, etc. But the yellow line drawn on there is the path of the Large Hadron Collider on the Swiss-French border. It's a giant machine. It is the largest science experiment, the most expensive science experiment ever constructed by humanity. 
And the sweet irony on, of that is that this largest machine ever constructed has been constructed so that we can study the smallest, most transient and ephemeral processes in nature. It's like a giant microscope that allows us to use fundamental particles to probe the structure of something that may have some very complex symmetries. If I were to try and bounce beach balls off of this, you notice that it probably wouldn't make much difference how this was oriented, or even how this was oriented. But a lot of times, in order to get a really small probe, a really high resolution probe of a, of a, of a phenomena, you're required to have a very high energy probe. So this Large Hadron Collider and its relatives around the world have been constructed to create high energy beams of particles that we use as microscopes to probe the fundamental aspects of natural processes and constituents. I think that makes this the coolest place on Earth. <laughs> <laughs> So, by the way, this is not only the hottest place on Earth, but the hottest place in the universe. Yeah, and, well, excepting alien civilization, so that's why I didn't say this is the hottest place in the world. I, I happen to be optimistic that uh, other sentient beings could have ar arisen in our universe, and they may also have similar or even better machines. So I wouldn't presume to say this is the hottest place in the universe. Uh, it's the hottest non- uh, non-natural place in the universe. No natural processes known can create something this hot. Alright, so now it's time to shift gears. Um, this is the really hard part of the talk. Uh, I have, I, I, I couldn't count up the number of books and articles and websites I've perused to try and get to this, uh, this stuff so that I can try to explain it intelligibly. It, to understand it deeply and profoundly requires at least a modicum of exposure to some mathematics. We're going to talk about that at the highest, briefest, most conceptual level I know how to do. Um, and I hope that I don't uh, turn anybody off with it. If you have questions along the way, don't hesitate to ask. I hope this car has some uh, all-terrain tires, because this is going to be a bit bumpy. <laughs> Let's go for a spin. One of the things that you might have encountered as you read news articles or as you read things about the, uh, the science of the Large Hadron Collider or other particle accelerators is that particles have an inherent property which we <coughs> denote as spin. So I'm just going to, I'm going to populate this slide and then I'm going to give you a um, more visceral demonstration of what I'm talking about. Alright, so I have, let's start with this, our happy little cone. So, Dave, would you mind making sure that the camera is able to, uh, to capture this? So I can take this object, and I'm going to do my best with my human fallibilities to move it. And I want you to pay attention, careful attention, as you would if you had an artist's eye, to the way this looks as I move it. So those of you on this part of the room see it almost face on. Those of you over here see it obliquely. What happens? I'm sorry I can't make my fingers invisible. Maybe I should have glued this to a stick. What happens when I move it across the room? Notice how your perspective of this changes. Now you begin to see it edge on over here, and here you see it obliquely. Let me do something different. Let me do this. Does that replicate, to, to, a, to a large extent, what you have just perceived? I'll do it over here. 
It started off like this, and it ended up like this. Notice that I, by virtue of that simple motion, I'm able to take what is otherwise a simple translation through space and instead characterize it as a rotation. So one of the things that is true about particle spin is when you take into account the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, one of the things that it says without recapitulating our quantum mechanics talk is that if you know the location of a particle, of a small thing, it could be an elephant, but the effect becomes most pronounced when you're talking about a really tiny thing like a particle. When you try to measure with ever more exactitude the position of a particle, you lose all information about how it's moving. Right? If I know for certain that this particle exists right here, I don't know if it's zipping along like that, or zipping along like that, or like that. I know almost nothing, if not nothing, about its state of motion. But we have just discovered that motion through space, in some deep sense, is similar to rotation in space. So when we talk about particle spin, we talk about this spin inherent to electrons and, and other fundamental particles. That spin arises because of this blurring of the lines between position and momentum. And the fact that we can interpret that as a spin. But it's not just a convenience of philosophy. We can measure that spin. One of the other aspects of quantum mechanics is that once you start dealing with really tiny things like particles, many of their exhibited properties only come in measurable bits, measurable increments. They don't have a continuous um, set of values. And one of those discrete measurements that we can make about a particle is its spin. We can choose any direction in space and by, by the way, the way we measure spin is if it happens to be a charged particle, the fact that it has an inherent property that's like spin gives it an inherent magnetic field because a moving <coughs> charge, not because a moving charge, but it's very similar to the phenomena in my macroscopic physics such that a moving charge gives rise to a magnetic field. This quantum mechanical inherent property of spin, this conflation between motion and rotation, gives rise to an inherent magnetic moment for particles. And we can measure that ma magnetic moment by imposing an external magnetic field and seeing how these particles align or move in that field. And we notice that when we do that, the magnetic properties of a particle are always exhibited in discrete quantities. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more about spin, and for this I'm going to use something besides a cone. Pardon me while I, while I get my paraphernalia together here. So that same experiment that we just did with a cone, that same philosophy, that same underlying physics applies to this. As I move this, as I translate it through space, because it happens to start out as a sphere, you may not perceive the fact that it also could be described by a rotation. So that's one of the reasons why it's easy to get confused about the inherent quality of spin of nuclear particles is because if you think of them as spherical objects, it's not intuitively obvious that spin arises. But if I do something to denote a particular place on this, it's already got a label on it, but I like my stars. All right. Now, if I start with 
You folks, can you just barely see this star? No. As I move it across the room, that star has rotated out of your field of view, I hope. Right? I'll do the same thing here. You can just barely see that star. So, insofar as we typically consider the spherical symmetries of particles, that inherent property of spin or rotation remains relevant. Now, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to rotate this object about that point, I hope. So, as I rotate it about that point, there's a, there's a concept called helicity or chirality that scientists use. One of the things you do is you point your thumb along any direction of motion. So I'm going to move this while rotating it. Alright? And while doing that, I'm going to point my thumb in the direction of the motion, and I'm going to make sure that my fingers curl around in the direction of spin. I'll do it for you. Well, I'll start up at the beginning and do it at the end. Depends what hand you use. I'm sorry? It depends what hand you use. Ah, oh, you're jumping ahead. You have this class. <laughs> All right. So, here I go. This is my direction of motion, this way, and this is my direction of spin. All right. This is called, any guesses? Right-handed spin. Right-handed chirality. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to go the other direction. Okay. This time, as I've already given you a clue by changing my hands. This time, if I'm rotating it in this direction, I have to use my left hand to point my thumb in the direction of motion and curl my fingers in the direction of spin. <coughs> so as this particle, or some particle that this represents, travels through space, we may ascribe to it an inherent chirality. It's either right-handed, or it's left-handed. It can't be both. Yes? Do scientists know whether particles are spherical? Um, yes and no. So there are some particles that are composite particles, like an atom. An atom is certainly not spherical. Uh, a proton and a neutron are composite particles. They are not spherical, if you probe them with a high enough resolution microscope to detect the bumps. Many of the particles of nature, such as the particles that go into making a proton and neutron, are believed to be point-like. So to talk about their geometric shape, aside from being a point, um, becomes specious. Now there are some people who say that if you zoom in close enough, that a proton, an electron, or a photon, or any other particle of nature begins to look like a little piece of string, or perhaps a loop of string. But that takes us a bit far afield from where I'm going today. Um, one of the things that is true is that particles generally exhibit spherical symmetries, except with regards to their helicity and their magnetism, which is what I'm talking about today. There's a preferred magnetic orientation of this, left-handed or right-handed. So it's not perfectly spherically symmetric in that respect. We can only talk about the things that we can measure, and one of the things we measure is the magnetic properties of particles. Okay? Shooter? Yes. Um, there's some thought that there's a difference between the mindset of a left-handed person and a right-handed person. Uh, does that hold true if there's so, uh, yes and no. Again, I love my answering questions like that because I'm always right. <laughs> so, um, just like people have a preference between left hand and right hand, one of the things we're going to talk about is how nature has a similar preference. But it's completely divorced from the exhibition of that preference at the scale of a human being. You're not people in here that are left-handed aren't left-handed because you have more left-handed electrons, right? There's no correlation there. But handedness is a useful concept, and having a preference for one hand over another is something that nature exhibits exceptionally surprising, and we're going to talk about that in a 
Yes. Does it have anything to do with the way the toilet bowl will circle one way depending on how close you are? No. Uh, that's due to something called the Coriolis force, and the force of that in your toilet bowl is so weak that the way your water goes down your toilet has a lot more to do with the direction of the jets and whatnot than the, yeah. and the water itself. Yeah. So I don't know if this is a distraction or the way you're going, but I, you know, when you're showing your thumb the direction, but it may be, you know, uh, takes me back to when I was trying to figure out how a gyroscope works, and I should be showing this. Is, is this getting into that? How it, I, I could not still figure out why a gyroscope could be horizontal and not fall. Right. Is, is this getting into that, or um, is that a distraction? One of the several books I read about this phenomena used a gyroscope as an example, uh, but it was describing a phenomena that I'm not li likely to talk about today. Okay. It, it had to do with a gyroscope. Very briefly, it spins, and it and you can set the point of a gyroscope on a pedestal, and the gyroscope <coughs> will go like this instead of falling like that. That's because as it's spinning, the part here that begins to fall also has a rotational motion, so the net motion actually points to the side instead of down. Because the parts that are falling one instant are also racing to the side, so it has a net momentum to the side. Okay, so back to yeah. Concept of, of handedness. I, I first ran across something like that, like in, in, uh, in electrical uh, classes, where you put electrons through a conductor and it sets up a magnetic field around the conductor according to you know the, the handedness. Yes. It, is that similar? similar? Yeah. There's a curl operator in in Maxwell's equations where you you take two vectors and then your thumb points in the third. That's the cross product of the vector. Similar, but um, I, I don't necessarily need to go into that level of mathematical detail to talk about this. Okay. So back to our spinning particle as it goes through space. Now I'm going to throw you for a loop a bit. What if, as this is spinning, and um, let's assume that it's got a right-handed spin. Let's say that I rush past this. I can't split myself into two. But uh, perhaps you can imagine, or maybe I can use somebody. Can you come up here and help me with this? I would like for you to just spin this um, in that direction, in the right-handed direction. Okay? Now, as I'm traveling along, if I travel at a speed that is greater than this thing, what do I see? <laughs> I see that it's moving in that direction relative to me. So the chirality that I ascribe to it, it's spinning in this direction, but it's moving in that direction. So the chirality has to be this way, just because my perspective of it is different. You see that? By changing the way I'm moving with respect to this spinning object, I flip its perceived direction of motion. So in that sense, I have a lot of latitude to arbitrarily assign its chirality, either, either left or right. Thank you very much. He's a trained physics teacher. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, done professionally. <laughs> now, some of you will remember from a few lectures ago that the ability I have to catch up to and surpass a zipping particle has a fundamental limitation on it. What is that limitation? The speed of light. So if I have a particle that's moving at the speed of light, and it has a certain chirality or handedness to it, there is no way in principle that I can ever assume a state of motion such that I can justify changing my perception of that chirality. That particle now has a handedness that is immutable that does not depend on any way I choose to measure it. So there's a special property of chirality that arises for things that move at the speed of light. Their chirality is predetermined when they are um, instantiated in our universe by some other physical process, and it cannot be changed. Well, that kind of makes us think that maybe there are two kinds of every particle. Maybe there's a particle with a right-handed chirality, 
right-handed, and a particle with a left-handed chirality. But we don't typically see that in nature. Now, interestingly, one of the things we can do in particle physics with those cool machines I saw is that we can make nearly any particle go near the speed of light. So this preference, this burning in of a particular kind of chirality can be approximated as closely as we wish by making a given set of particles go fast enough that it becomes really, 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 really hard to catch up with them. And so they approximate ever more perfectly a particle that is spinning like this or a particle that's spinning like this. Does that make sense? Strangely? Question here, sir? Yeah. yeah. Could you um, just elaborate a little bit more about the this, this fact that spin is in name to all quantum? So how do we know that? Um, that, that comes about from the fact that they're really tiny, and um, this, the uncertainty in their momentum, or their position, gives rise to a certain fuzziness about how they're moving like this, or this, and that uncertainty, which can never be overcome because it's an innate aspect of nature, can easily be interpreted, remember this experiment? can easily be interpreted as imparting spin. So at some sense, in a very real sense, at a quantum mechanical level, this kind of spin, where's my star? <coughs> this kind of spin, and spin that arises because of transverse motion, become indistinguishable from one another. And because there's always a certain amount of this kind of motion, and they're indistinguishable, everything has an inherent spin based upon its uh, size and a few other properties. <coughs> yeah? But you said spin was quantized into just half, half, half numbers or something. Didn't you say that or did you not say that? I, I didn't talk about quantum uh, half integer spin. I haven't, I haven't distinguished between what are called bosons and fermions. I don't intend to, because it, it, I, I have limited time. It's a big topic. <laughs> all right. Um, so all of this stuff up here, all the words on this slide should make more sense to you now. And this, this is essentially what I just covered. So this is the math part. Um, I'd like all of you to solve this equation and bring me a result, please. <laughs> so the only thing that's really relevant about this equation for, for our purposes are two aspects. The first aspect is that it looks like a wave. This is the Schrodinger equation, which is one of the ways to represent the, the state <coughs> of a quantum mechanical system, which is any system that has a very tiny particle that is subjected to things like the uncertainty principle. For our purposes, recognize that there's a wave associated with it. Also, I want to point out one mathematical aspect of this. And that is, uh, let's see, actually, there's the wave. A more formal representation looks like this. You notice this little letter I sitting out over here? That becomes really important. It turns out that in order to describe the mathematics of a quantum mechanical system, you must use that I. And if you remember, I guess, from December or so when we talked about mathematics, we talked a little bit about that number. And it happens to be called by mathematicians around the world an imaginary number. I think that's a kind of a bad name because it seems scary. So instead, I named them llama numbers. Because llamas are cute and not scary. The idea is that it represents a particular mathematical concept. And the mathematical concept need not be intimidating or scary. It's actually relatively straightforward. Those are the only two pieces about the mathematics that you need to know to follow the rest of the lecture. There, I'm going to talk a little bit about the implications of there being an imaginary or llama number. And the fact that quantum phenomena exists 
wave-like properties. One of the things that we can do with a wave is that we can consider a quantity known as phase. You'll notice that the red and the blue waves are almost identical. One is just shifted forward with respect to the other. Right? Well, it turns out that when the Schrodinger equation was developed, one of the things that scientists took note of is that because the solution happens to be a wave, it turns out that you can start that wave at any point you wish. You can give it any phase you wish. You could start it here. You could bring this over by the axis. You could bring this part over by the axis. And the physical quantities that it would predict are identical. And yet, even though the physical quantities that this wave predicts that we will measure, <laughs> the wave itself has changed. And if I have absolute latitude to change the phase of this wave, everybody know what I mean by phase now, where it starts? If I have absolute latitude to change the phase of this wave, in order for all the quantum phenomena that it predicts to be consistent with our measurement, I would have to change that phase everywhere in space at exactly the same time. Well, now we run into our old friend relativity again. Relativity says, no, oh, you can't do that. You can't make a change instantaneously across all of space. The best you can do is to make a change that propagates at the speed of light. So this notion that you could change the phase of a quantum mechanical system under a global, what's called a global transformation, nobody questioned until somebody noticed that relativity says you can't do it. And then they started looking for a mechanism whereby you could change the phase locally. Now, I don't have a good picture of that, but imagine if I've got those two waves and I decide at some arbitrary point in space and time to shift the phase of a single wave by a given amount starting at a particular point, now I've got to jump in the way that wave looks. It's no longer the same wave. The symmetry that it exhibited under global transformations is lost when I take just a piece of it and try to shift it. Does that make sense? Okay. Well, the notion that I could have a global symmetry on a quantum system that would instantaneously communicate across galaxies is preposterous given relativity. This is just another example of that. You take these waves that indicate the probability of measuring a given system's value, it's just inconceivable that you would be able to change those throughout the universe all at once. So what happened? We're going to get to that, but first we need to have a little bit of a uh, digression into this notion of uh, the numeral i. So this is a refresher. I've gone through this twice before. This will be the third time. Hopefully the third time is a charm. If you take a number such as 1 and you multiply it by itself, 1 times 1 is? You can do that any number of times you like, and you get? Right? What happens if you do negative 1 times itself? You get a positive one. So one of the things you'll notice is that if you do that for negative one times negative one, it flips between negative one and positive one. So a negative one kind of imposes in the mathematics of whatever you're describing a, a polarity, either positive or minus, and it flips between the two. Let's define a new number such that we multiply it by itself and instead of getting positive 1, we always get negative 1. So we multiply it by itself, and we get negative 1. We're going to call this number i, for lack of a better term. We could call it lama. We multiply it by itself. By definition, we get negative 1. By definition, if we do it again, we're multiplying negative 1, which is this side. <coughs> So we collapse these two into a negative 1, and now we multiply it by i, and that gives us a negative i. Right? We do it again, and we get a positive 1. 
We do it again and we get a positive i. So this number provides four discrete states of existence when it's incorporated into our mathematics. Another way of looking at that, um, which I won't go into great detail, is you can also look at these as rotations. But remember, I've just been spending a lot of time talking about rotations when I talk about spin. So it may be that when we talk about rotations and physical phenomena, it makes sense to introduce this number. And that's, uh, for those of you who have had experience with a Fourier series, which describes a function by an arbitrary periodic function, if we have a periodic function, a sine wave or a cosine wave, a lot of those uh, functions can be decomposed uh, such that they are made up of parts that have imaginary components. So that's our refresher about the letter, uh, or the numeral I. And that should be it in terms of the mathematics. It should be smooth sailing from here on out. Okay, this is another part where I need to just talk about it. So, when scientists recognized that you could take that quantum wave function, and subject it to global changes in its phase, and you would permit, you would end up with the same exact system. That didn't surprise anyone. But again, we introduced this problem of relativity. So to work around this problem, some brilliant scientists came up with this idea about something called local phase invariance for the quantum wave function. Who ever thought that you'd be listening to a lecture where you now understand what local phase invariance of a quantum wave function Okay. So when you talk about the local phase invariance, it perturbs, it changes the measurable outcomes of that physical system. But it shouldn't. One of the things that we presumed about nature is that we can choose where our mathematical description of that system starts with arbitrariness. And it shouldn't change the way we measure the system. In order to get the math to reproduce what we measure in reality, you have to introduce a fudge factor into the Schrodinger wave equation. This fudge factor exactly compensates for the perturbation in breaking the picture of that wave function as we subject it to local phase changes. That's cool enough, but here's the, here's the zinger. When you <clears throat> interpret the mathematics of that perturbation, you end up describing the photon. The electromagnetic force arises because of a symmetry due to relativity. The conservation of electric charge, the way that the electric forces work, that gets incorporated into our theory of fundamental particles because relativity is real. Relativity imposes its own kind of symmetry in natural processes. And when you explicitly account for that symmetry in the mathematics, it gives rise to the description of a physical phenomena known as a photon and known as electric charge. It's amazing. Of course, the people who did that came up with a Nobel Prize. Okay? Well, electricity isn't the only, and the electromagnetic forces aren't the only forces in nature. We also have something uh, called the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force and gravity. Gravity is the black sheep of the herd. We're not going to talk much about it today because nobody knows how to fit it in yet. But let's talk about the weak nuclear force. What is the weak nuclear force? When a neutron sits by itself in space, it will decay into a proton and an electron in about 11 minutes. That decay, where you change the very nature of a particle from one kind of thing to another kind of thing, always entails something called the weak force or the weak interaction. Changing the way something is built, changing its very identity, necessarily involves an interaction. And that interaction <coughs> is always the weak nuclear force. The weak nuclear force is amazing for that characteristic. 
So the weak nuclear force can take a particle. I'm going to name one. It doesn't really matter what it is. I'm going to name it a pion. You can take a pion, and it can decay over time into, uh, I, I actually don't remember. Okay, what do you know? A photon? Uh, well, a pion can decay in many particles. Uh, that's not your body. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> So it's got many. No, but any given that, 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 that doesn't solve the key channels. Okay. For the power. So many, many of these. In, in, in electron in a neutrino, for example. Okay. Neutral, a neutral pion can uh, uh, go to a W boson and then that can uh, uh, decay to an uh, electron in a neutrino. That's what it's about. Okay. So there are many different ways that a given particle, like our pion, can decay into one or more product particles. And each of these have associated with them a probability. But here's where something really, really strange begins to happen in nature. Back in the 70s, I think it was, um, some people, including Leon Letterman, who used to be the director of Fermilab, did this experiment. <laughs> Remember that as I take a particle and As I make it go faster and faster, it more closely appro approaches being a particle that has a complete, constant, irrevocable, irrevocable chirality. So what Leon Lederman and some of his colleagues did was they took some very fast particles and then looked at the way that chirality affects the way that they decay via the weak force into other particles of nature. And they found something astonishing. The weak force only works on particles that have a left-handed chirality. If you have a right-handed particle, one that's uh, spinning the other way, so it's spinning uh, right-handed, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Getting these vectors in your head can be confusing. Um, in any case, when you get a particle, uh, I did it wrong the first time, when you get a particle that's left-handed, the weak force can interact with that particle and cause it to decay into other particles. That's why we have nuclear radiation. And the inverse of that is why we have um, nucleosynthesis happening in stars. The second lecture this year, I talked about the way nucleosynthesis happens. All of that happens by virtue of the weak nuclear force. Hydrogen, helium would not be, would not have been converted into the carbon and water that we see, uh, oxygen and whatnot we see around us without the action of the weak nuclear force. But the weak nuclear force only deals with particles in nature that have a left-handed chirality. That seems to imply that for every particle in nature, there's actually two kinds. There's a left-handed kind and a right-handed kind. There's a left-handed electron and a right-handed electron. There's a left-handed proton and a right-handed proton. But we only see that definite handedness when we impose that handedness on particles moving near the speed of light. If a particle moves slower than the speed of light, one of the things that happens because of the uncertainty principle, remember our good friend the uncertainty principle, is that it can be seen to swap from left to right handed fairly continuously and arbitrarily. So the reason that every ordinary temperature at which we have particles finds all particles, um, except for the most fundamental ones that have no decay path, like an electron, the reason that we find all of those pions decaying is because since they are moving slower than the speed of light, they're oscillating between a right-handed and left-handed type due to the uncertainty principle. And here's the second zinger of the lecture. That oscillation, the rate of that oscillation, is dictated by an interaction that can be mathematically described as interacting with a constant sea of energy that pervades space. Because this flip-flopping from right to left and back again happens for every particle everywhere in space in the same way, at the same rate, it means that there's an attribute of space that must be the same everywhere, every direction, every when. That attribute is called the Higgs field. 
And our special guest today in the lecture is the Higgs particle. I didn't tell anyone that we'd talk about it. But that's where the Higgs particle that you've heard so much comes into play. Is that the Higgs particle is a physical manifestation of this um, Higgs field that is implicated in the flip-flop of particles from left to right-handed chirality. But it also has another implication. The rate of this flip-flop is mass. It's exactly correlated with mass. So the Higgs particle and the Higgs field in part to what would otherwise be particles moving at the speed of light with a constant chirality, it imparts to them a necessary property that they move slower than light and a inertia, and we interpret that in every case as mass. The mass of all fundamental particles, with a couple of exceptions, come from interaction with the Higgs field and the Higgs particle. This equation up top, U1 cross SU2, it's a very much abbreviated version of everything I've just said. And one of the predictions of that is that the Higgs particle must exist. That's why they spent billions of dollars building that giant machine to verify that our view of nature regarding the Higgs particle was true. And it was. And it is. Okay, so this is mostly what I've talked about. Um, I'll let you read through it, and then I'll comment on that last line. For those of you who can't read like, uh, far away, particles of ordinary matter when moving slower than light flip-flop between left and right chirality. We talked about that. They, uh, they only decay when they're in their left state. Physicists have named this parity violation. You may have seen CP violation or parity violation. That's what we've been talking about. Something must facilitate or mediate this change from left to right. That something is the Higgs boson and the Higgs field. The oscillation, and hence the Higgs interaction, causes mass for ordinary matter. So that, taken together, constitutes what's known as the standard model of particle physics. I didn't talk much about the strong force because of limited time, etc. But uh, I can assure you that a very similar treatment can also describe the symmetries involved and the properties of the strong nuclear force. When you take the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force and the electromagnetic force and you see that there's one model that encompasses the phenomena that all of them exhibit, you find out that that model has, depending on how you count them, 25 or 26 what are called free parameters. In other words, the value of those parameters in our model of the universe must be measured and not calculated or predicted. <coughs> That's often seen as a failing of this model. If you've got 27 or, or I'm sorry, 25 or 26 variables that you must plug in to get the right answer, and, and you have to measure them instead of solving for them, then that says that our view of nature may be incomplete. And it's the implication of what may be an incomplete view of nature that has inspired people to pursue things like string theory and supersymmetry and other theories of nature that try to reduce the number of free parameters. In the case of string theory, um, I have mixed feelings about it because in many cases it's introduced much more than just 26 free parameters. Essentially, you can have an infinite number of free parameters, which is maybe not an improvement. Um, but that's the standard model of particle physics. Next time, we will talk about the standard model of cosmology. One of the things about cosmology, which is the shape, the overall properties, the history, evolution, and future of our universe, many of those things are also informed by our knowledge of particle physics. So next month will be the final lecture in this year's series of Quest discussions, and it will be about the standard model of cosmology. Any other questions? She's raising her left hand, of course. <laughs> questions? <laughs>
All right, you all now know the uh, standard model of particle physics. Thank you very much. I'll be around with their questions.